morning, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to be at the beginning of a series of conversations with Robert Sardello, and we're going to be discussing integral spiritual psychology. Um, I don't really have much more of a preface than that. <laughs> um, where do you think we should begin, Robert? Well, I'd, I'd like to begin with, uh, because over the times we're together, working with some of the material that are in the three volumes called the Collective Notes of Integral Spiritual Psychology. And, and uh, the, the very first in that first volume concerns, you know, kind of the foundations of integral spiritual psychology, where it comes from, its relationship to other psychologies, what is its particular that has to do with the way of the heart and and uh, what backs that. And uh, so it's, it's a bit of a, a background, but not, I hope that it's a background that is um, spoken by us in a way that can be felt rather than uh, another thing to know about. <laughs> too much to know about already. So, uh, so that's a real challenge to actually speak about it. <laughs> there I use the word to speak of it and be true to what it is in order for us to understand integral spiritual psychology the language has to meet it in a certain way is that fair yes that's right it's true it's true of all psychology but that's it's forgotten that is uh the, the word psychology psyche logos the speech of the soul so uh, psychology is, is really not intended, although it's become that, a way of talking about what's going on in our inner life or, or trying to solve problems or go to the psychologist and you know, who knows. And psycho the soul is known through soul. Mm. So we're using the, 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 <laughs> we're using the part, we're using the capacity to explore. It's unusual in that you, there's no outside perspective. You have to use soul to explore soul. There's also no inside perspective in that the, the inner and the outer are actually always unified. And it's only because of uh, mentalism, you know, that we, we think that there's an inside of us and then there's the outside that, we, that is supposedly objective, while the inside is supposedly subjective. Mm -hmm. But in, but in that, 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 and we, we, we come to live by that kind of theory, I mean, for a long, long, long time. <laughs> But in actual living itself, I mean, we don't go around having that sense of, no, am I inside myself or am I on the outside world? It's all just here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that split had already occurred even before the birth of Western psychology. Western psychology properly. Oh, 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 oh yes, that's a, that's a, well. It might be interesting to to even ask where the word originates. See, it, it's not doesn't go back, for example, to say Aristotle, who talks a lot of has a lot of philosophy of the soul, but I don't think he ever uses the word psyche. Or, and certainly not psychology. And that is not, that word doesn't originate until 1590, around there, hmm. by a theologian whose name is Philippe Melanchthon. 
yeah. He was a uh, advisor to Martin Luther. And it's really, really important though, that 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 he he names psychology because prior to Martin Luther, the soul was the exclusive province of the Catholic Church. I mean, they were the, and still try to be, <laughs> the arbiters of what counts as your soul. And they're, they're the ones that are going to tell you how to save your soul and, and tell you when you're off and tell you when you, and, you know, and when you sin and all of that. What's amazing about Martin Luther is to free that, you know, to get free of that which then, see, also frees the soul mm. from, that, from that link to being under the control of the church. So you need, that's why this term comes about. Here, here's the realm of the speech of the soul. Mm. Mm. Very, very, very important movement. Um, it doesn't last. <laughs> it doesn't last because then science comes in and there begins to be a, an attempted science of the soul. Wilhelm Bundt tries to measure sensations and reactions and, and, and so it goes in that direction. Psychology goes in that direction for a long, long time. Still greatly influenced by it. I mean, when I went to graduate school, I thought, oh boy, we're going to study the soul. <laughs> it was never mentioned once in four years. I almost got thrown out of graduate school five times for asking soul questions. <laughs> right. Did, did Wundt still use the term soul? No. No, it was already... It was been gone, yeah. Yeah. So when when Freud and later Jung used the term soul, was that controversial at the time? Yeah, totally controversial. Uh, and uh, and that, that you see that comes about because the you know, the absence of any sense of the soul in life begins to express itself, the absence expresses itself as pathologies. You know, so, so Jung says the soul has become our diseases. And, and it, it, it wasn't that, you know, Freud and, and Jung sat back and thought, well, now we're going to find a way to speak soul. They were confronted with these uh, an anomalies or these difficulties for, for Freud. It's hysteria primarily. Uh, and for Jung, it's, it's uh, deeper, deep, something deeper. Mm -hmm. hmm. So Freud's this sort of really unusual figure because he's resurrecting the idea of soul, but at the same time, he has this commitment to materialism. Yeah, he's, he, he's definitely within the line of science and he felt he was doing science and it's just a different kind of science. Uh, that's not, and that, that's, Jung really departs from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but Jung himself felt obliged to maintain a kind of uh, Kantian posture for the sake of the academy, that, that he was saying that I can speak to the truth of what goes on in soul but I can't speak to what that's actually referring to. You know, in a certain way, uh, Jung is so interesting because who he is as a living uh, researcher of soul and in, 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 in his own experience and 
how he presents that in a conceptual language through, the, you know, which we have these volumes of, of Jung. Uh, in that sense, he, he actually does still belong to the line of science. He's trying to be, you know, give something that's repeatable and understandable and so on. But his, he, he, his, his main subject is himself. Mm -hmm. As we find out, you know, with the Red Book, it's really, really clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that none, neither uh, Freud nor Jung, while they, you know, have, are recovering psyche logos, they are... Uh, Freud certainly keeps that separate from anything having to do with spirit or spiritual. Uh, Jung, Jung does approach the realm of spiritual, but in terms of archetypes of the soul. <laughs> uh, so I have to, we have to in, in terms of a kind of a context of integral spiritual psychology, there's one other person of great importance, who is Rudolf Steiner. Because Steiner does attempt a phenomenological presenting of the evolution of the human being, including and primarily the human being as a being of spirit. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I mean, so, so his own research takes place by the fact that he developed a high level of clairvoyance. Mm -hmm. and, and, but he, he brought down what he saw clairvoyantly in forms that could be useful to humanity. Mm -hmm. works in medicine and in, you know, in education, in agriculture, in art, all kinds of areas as a kind of a new forming of the human being. Although he, he does not have an explicit psychology. <laughs> Although he did say that uh, psyche was disappearing in the world. He was keenly aware of that. He's aware of it. The only reason he didn't develop that or talk about that is because nobody asked him. <laughs> right, know. right, right. He was pretty much cold shouldered by the world of so, psychology and depth psychology. Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's not, it's different now, but when I, I mean, I, I Integral spiritual psychology has always been very indebted to him. At first, uh, it was completely what it, when I when my work is completely not accepted to in 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 anthroposophy at all. I mean, and the people would say, "We don't need a psychology; we have spirituality." That has changed a, a great deal now, but for a long, I mean, that's, uh, I have not developed what I would call an anthroposophical psychology at all. Uh, but, but do want to recognize the indebtedness of the work of Steiner. Mm -hmm. But that's just a little bit, the, the, the the other aspect, the other dimension is, I mean, psychology, psychology, the logos of the psyche is never finished. It never becomes something, so now we have that is psychology. <laughs> it, right. it should, it it's really has to be unending. I mean, it's unfolding because the soul is not a thing. It is not static. It's not, you know, you have a soul. <laughs> We don't have a soul, we are in soul. We are within soul. So, uh, so 
integral spiritual psychology is also a response to these times, a really a response to these times, which uh, I don't mean just the present time, although this present moment is really, really crucial, but I mean the, the time of uh, present civilization, uh, in which, for example, the, the human being in the collective world is just, uh, we, we live our life only as kind of beings of the brain and the liver, <laughs> is one way of saying it. That, that you know, that it, it, living means you think and you emote. And the, the, the liver is kind of the center of emotion. So you think about something and then you react to it. And then, and then the will carries it out. And, and they're awfully, mostly mixed. The thinking and the emotion get all confused together. And that's the realm of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> and so most thinking isn't even thinking. It's, it's very, very colored by emotion. That's our civilization. And, uh, and you can see why it gives rise to all kinds of things about conspiracies and, you know, and all, all of that, because it's, there's, not, there's not clear thinking and there's not the realm of feeling. Yeah, the realm of feeling, which is the, the, the heart. So just for the sake of the audience, we are making a distinction between emotions and feeling. Yes, when they're, they're, they're confused. Mm. So the realm of feeling is different than having feelings. Mm. And when I say, if I have a feeling, that, that just means that I'm going, that's an emotion. You know, or if I say, well, this is the way that I feel about it. That's kind of a mixture of thinking and emotion. Mm -hmm. The realm of feelings is, is the realm of the heart. And it, feeling means exactly what the word says, feeling, which means feeling is, is touch. You know, if, I'm, if I put my hand on the table here, oh, I feel the table. That is, I know the table through intimacy of being with it. I don't know, my feelings don't know about it. They know within it, with it. Mm. For example, the, the whole dimension of all of art centers in feeling. Mm -hmm. It's painting or music or poetry or any, any art is a, is expresses the realm of feeling. So, it's a way of knowing something that cannot be known in any other way. You go to a symphony and you're, you're, you're moved throughout your whole being because it, it is a speaking directly with the heart. Well, I mean, I, I, I can do a critique of Tchaikovsky's Ionata opera or something like that, but that doesn't have anything to do with this realm of feeling. When you sit there, you're intimately within an unfolding of the realm of feeling. So you're bodily changed. You're, you're transformed with, in the realm of feeling, but in a very bodily way. So there's a kind of intimacy in feeling that's probably not in any other human faculty. Not, right, it's not in any other human faculty, but it, it, it's just, it's really intended, be, intended to be the way of living, meaning we live intimately, not only with ourselves and others, but with earth and nature and all of the, you know, the trees and the birds and the flowers and the animals and, and the cosmos. That's all, that's all. 
that's all intimate unfolding, intimately unfolding as a complex whole. And uh, it's the mind that makes the separations. And it, it's not against mind because it, you know, a lot happens because of those separations, but a lot is lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Minds will always abstract us away from that. Or, or if mind is not somehow with feeling, it will abstract. Mm -hmm. yeah. The conceptual mind separates us. There's a way of being within mind that is also within body, that is within heart, within attention. And that 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 it's a primary method of the integral spiritual psychology, which is the method of phenomenology. <laughs> Again, a sorry, a big word. Phenomenology is the logos or the word of phenomena. So then, so that that it's it's the attempt to listen inwardly to any phenomenon, to let it reveal what it is. Like like I mean, I remember when I was learning phenomenology, learning <laughs> uh, we had to, we had to write descriptions of a pencil. What are you going to say? See, if I say, oh, this is, a, this is a pencil, that's not, that's a concept. Right. It's talking about something. It's not, it's not what the thing is at all. Mm -hmm. So you would have to write, you know, well, the fingers moving around, the longing, uh, coloring, trace leaving, paper connecting, you just keep going that way until, until there's a picture, an image, that then we have an inner sense of, oh my gosh, what a, what a, what a presence a pen is. What a presence. <laughs> and uh, even, even to the point of having a sense of this, this has its own kind of life. Thing. So that that's crucial to integral spiritual psychology is allowing well that it, 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 to be present with the immediacy of experience. The immediacy of unfolding experience, mm -hmm. and this necessarily changes the orientation around time. Completely. So one little thing about it, the word experience. And unfortunately, I, can't, I looked all over and I can't find it again. I once found this. I did. I really found it. The word experience means without fear. Really? Yeah. That's the crucial thing is that what brings about separations between things and knowledge is fear. Because if I separate it, then maybe I can control it. And, and then that we begin then to do that. You know? I mean, begin to do that. That's now the whole of the world. Mm -hmm. That uh, immediate unfolding of experience is lost. Uh, we, as I said, we live either in the head or in the emotions. Mm -hmm. The heart doesn't know how to do that. <laughs> the heart only knows immediacy. And given what you said earlier about integral spiritual psychology emerging in this, this time, it seems to me that it's a time when we have terrible fear about the unfolding future. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a, it's a moment. moment. Extraordinary moment. 
we'll see what is how it unfolds. Again, we've lived in the uh, sense of fear since well, the, the last time that people lived in the way that I'm trying, we're trying to describe in this kind of immediacy was in the 13th century. And, and the, that was the time that uh, then the Inquisition came along and killed over a million people who lived uh, phenomenologically, who lived the immediacy of heart presence in the world in relation to, you know, to others and earth and everything. Those were the so-called Cathars. So-called, I mean, they were the Cathars. The word means pure, but it doesn't mean, pure means they were pure, pure human, period. <laughs> pure human as, as world presence, earth presence, other presence, cosmos presence. And the, that was a terrible threat to the church because they lived there, the Cathars lived without control, without needing a sense of outer control. So the, so the Inquisition got rid of them, but the Inquisition was the beginning of the kind of governing that we're still within. Mm -hmm. So this moment is, is again, it's a moment when that's trying, it's really the end, the end of the Roman time. The question will be, you know, will it, will it metamorphose into some other kind of control or is it possible to again awaken into fullness? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. But if we're locked up in fear and we're not able to be present to the unfolding moment, then we're going to try to understand or control the situation by with reference to the past. We're going to try to understand this in terms of what's already happened. Is that the safe way to put it? Uh, to extend a, a kind of conceptual knowing that is now, you know, certainly a past, but that extension now is the technological dimension. So we are at this, this moment, it can be an opening to wholeness, or it can be technocracy as the new method of control. We'll see. Interesting. So even the the attempt at technocracy itself is a is a something of a of a big change in, yeah. in, the, in the method of control coming. Yeah. And as you know, it will mean even a less sense of, of being embodied. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. an attempt to, you know, it's the movement toward complete disembodiment, so-called AI, so-called singularity, all of those, all of those notions. Mm -hmm. And and but it also means a further loss of the body of Earth. Mm -hmm. But. Let's not go too far into that now because because we'd rather present a kind of alternate way, not a conspiratorial or something, but just uh, well, what about this complete way of wholeness and try and that that's really what integral spiritual psychology in is a response to this time. So if we can get you were really on to something with the question of time. Mm -hmm. And that because 
psychology also got caught in the sense of the human being beings. We are who we are due to what has happened to us in the past. Mm -hmm. So and that's certainly Freud <laughs> explores the human being as a being shaped by what has happened to 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 us mm -hmm. and he's interested only in the in the personal and the individual and you know that that well we forget or what has happened to us is traumatic and and that just is another way of saying fear has separated us from our past and that his work was the recovery of the personal past. For though, not for the sake of wholeness so much, but for the sake of the ego. Mm. So he says, where id was, meaning bodily unconsciousness was, there ego will be, the sense of me. Oh, now I know who I am because I remember where I came from and I, I can shed the fears that were involved in that. And now I am an ego. And that's true. And it's wonderful, extraordinary. But we're also more than ego. It, it loses, the, begins to lose the soul already in its, in it. That's what Jung's, hmm, that's how he deviates from Freud and found Freud inadequate and separates from him because he, he understood there was a sense of something more than our immediate sense of ourselves as, as I. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he explores not just personal memory, but mythic memory. Myth, not as a tale or a story, but the, the word myth, Iliadi has a, he was a great mythologist in his sense of description of what is myth. Myth is something that never happened, but is always happening. Yes. Beautiful. So, so, so something that is way beyond the individual, we are within it, but it is always continually happening and unfolding. It can't be known only as you know about things. You have to know you're in it from within its happening, which presents itself as imagined images. That's Jung. But is Jung also looking backwards in a, in a way similar to Freud? Looking into the past? Uh, the way that Freud utilizes personal memories and freeing those memories to come to the eye Jung uses, utilizes, I won't say, utilizes myth to explore the fullness of the human being as coming into a kind of uh, uh, individuation is the word he uses. Mm -hmm. I just know myself as an ego. I know myself as belonging within the wholeness of ongoing, unfolding imagination that is both personal and way beyond personal. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, you know, but we're on to something that the, the difference now, so uh, there's, there's aspects of, of both of those in integral spiritual psychology, but there's also, and this, this is due really to Rudolf Steiner, who, uh, speaks of the time current from the future yes. 
an actual, so if, if, we, if you do, you kind of see it, there's a time current from the past that is leading toward the future. We all hold that, that well, I guess that, that's the way life takes place from the past to the present toward the unknown future. But Steiner says there's also a time stream that is coming from the future into the present and even into the past. So it's not the past is never finished, it's, it's also still becoming. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But the, the time stream from the future, well, you can't know it as a content because it hasn't happened yet. Right. <laughs> right. So it, it's a current, but, but you, it, the only way that you can be present to the felt sense of there's something coming is the realm of feeling. You can feel, and we, we call it, you know, in our lives, we call it a, uh, either longing or destiny is the word. De what is my destiny? Mm -hmm. And we don't know it because it's not a content, but we feel it mm -hmm. and as long as we're, you know, we're not taken over by some outer control that tells you how to live completely. The, the, that's not completely taken over. You, you'll, you'll feel the presence of your destiny. You won't know it, but you'll do anything in your life to follow it. Do we feel the presence uh, do we feel the absence of our sense, a sense of destiny? Yes, but it, it's felt as, uh, what the hell am I doing? I go to work and I, you know, I, I, I give myself to work and, and then what, what for? And it doesn't have any sense of meaning. And uh, I only do it, you know, waiting for the vacation. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah, the other thing that comes in, oh, yes, money. That's it. <laughs> right. Yeah, but that's those are all coverings, you know, for the, uh, and, and as you know, people, you know, younger people, they feel the sense of destiny. And at a kind of midlife, so called midlife crisis, that's the last time really it announces itself in a strong way. It says, get, get going, and, and you can still, you can still begin to uncover the destiny. Sitting here, just it's just bubbling up inside of me. Is it safe to say that when we are in the natural world, when we are present to nature, that we are we get that stronger sense of the forces of destiny working? Absolutely, because nature is not finished ever. Earth is not finished ever. And, and, and it, it doesn't have, you know, it's not, well, it's, I mean, if it's allowed to be nature, yes, for sure, you can't help but feel the unfolding that you're within that is also part of who we are. Yeah. But, um, I mean, that's been reduced to going on vacation. <laughs> right. Right, or I take a walk in the woods to yes relax or something. Yes, yeah, yeah. and that's exactly what what we're in integral psych, spiritual psychology. We're trying to take not take that notice that that there is that natural unfolding presence, and ask well, what is the organ that can be developed? to be able to be present to that unfolding all the time. Mm -hmm. And that, again, is the realm of the heart. Yeah. So maybe with some of the time we have left, we can kind of make a picture of what does it mean to work with that organ or to make that to make being with that organ at the center of this kind of being slash doing 
Yeah. Probably, I really do very much want to get to that. It may be next time we'll see. Because uh, I'll have to, have to try to ask. So I, I didn't invent integral spiritual psychology. <laughs> I don't think actually anybody invents psychology. They can take credit for it as if they did, but they I didn't invent it. I'm not inventing it. It's it's it's. But there, that that's why uh, Freud goes to personal memories. Jung goes to mythic memories. See so what what is it that what is the larger backing and. Integral psychology, it isn't just personal memory at all. It isn't just collective mythic dimensions. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the, the word for it is to recognize that we are living in this wholeness life in connection with the unfolding of everything else, that is called a saga. <laughs> I'm sorry? A saga, S-A-G-A. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. That is integral spiritual psychology is backed by a saga, not by myths or personal memories. The, for the particular saga that is a great important saga, the two words saw, ga. Ga means divine, and saw, saw means of the, the divine unfoldment of the world, the unfolding of the world, saga. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's really an interesting kind of picture. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the saga that, that we're within is, and speaking as integral spiritual psychology is the grail saga. And the particular grail saga is the saga that is titled Parsival, written by Wilhelm von Eschenbach in the Middle Ages. Uh, the, the name Parsival, Parsival, the word itself means Piercing through the middle. Piercing through the middle means the, the word Parsival means that. Yes. Yeah. Means it's it's it already tells you this is the story of the felt longing and pain and joy that is the realm of the feeling heart. So, so I mean, just just when we feel our, the, the heart is first felt as a kind of ongoing combination of longing and sorrow. If if I separate those, if I'm if I if I say I'm going to just follow my longing, that becomes manic because it's only spirit becomes manic. I've got to find that. I've got to find that. If I if I if I only concentrate and, and be present to sorrow, oh, that becomes depression. You see? And when they're together but not conscious bodily, that becomes manic depression. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out what is life about, but everything is so painful, I can't. So part, part, you know, to, well, be, because you can't do that with your mind. Right. You can't do that with your mind. So Parsival is also the fool. He's the fool. 
in the, in the first little story in the Parsifal story, when he's a child, he's out playing with nature, with birds, and all of a sudden, a group of knights comes riding up in armor, and the sun is flashing in the armor, and he sees the brilliance of the sun, the radiance of the sun reflected. You know, he only sees the radiance. He does. And he says, uh, whatever that is, that's what I'm, I must be. <laughs> I, I absolutely must become that radiance. And, and then the rest of the story, but well, let me say a little bit more about his being a fool. Because <laughs> uh, that's what we have to be to, to in this particular way. The way of love is the way of being a fool. But so imagine the fool, the, a good picture is the Tarot, you know, the, the first card and the zero, <laughs> yeah. the zero, the nothing card is, is the fool. And the fool is, you know, he's, he's, he's walking away. He has his little knapsack on his back, means that this art, it's an instruction on how to enter in the heart. You have to, you have to release holding on to anything. You only have your little, your little <laughs> pajamas and your, your everything else. It doesn't matter whether you actually do or not. That doesn't, that, that has to do with the, you don't have any sense, you, you don't, you're not holding on to anything as, oh, this is what makes my life worthwhile. You, and so he's walking out, you know, he's, he's in the world and there's a, a dog nipping at his, his trousers and back. Even in some of the cards, you see that the dog, dog has pulled down his trou trousers, exposing his genitals. And he's walking out into the world, and he's carrying a walking stick. That so he's a that that's he's a fool. He's given up everything, in, in the sense of having anything. He's walking into nothing. He has no notion of. You know, it's like that, that's the sense of the first sense of the future has no content. I don't know where I'm going. I'm just going. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm going completely naked. That's the even. So it's like saying uh, it's a spiritual path in the presence of the fullness of the world. And we go into it completely naked, but and the walking stick, the only other card in the whole tarot where there's a walking stick is the hermit and the walking stick. So that's the that's the image of of the only thing you have to you have to hold on to is a sense of this place that I am within is the inner place. Mm -hmm. that, that, so, so that's, yeah, that is a wonderful, so it's the backing, all of this story backs the particular phenomena that we then begin to explore descriptively through developing the capacity of the heart to be in the presence of an inner silence and listening to allow the world to unfold in its presence, in her presence. Sorry, that was a little. <laughs> no, no, it's fantastic. Um, and the central image in this is the chalice or the veil, yes. the, the empty receptive. Yes. Vessel. Beautiful. And then, so, so grail means receive. Oh. You receive every, and so you know what, so it's, it's the capacity, again, the fool, it's how to be receptive. 
that, that the heart knows through receptivity, not through willfulness. So, so it'll, it, 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 it opens up a completely different way of being in life. Listening, letting whatever, whatever presents itself, if we can be free enough just to listen, meaning that, you know, if somebody curses me, I don't particularly get caught in feeling terrible guilt or shame or sorrow, anything like that. I'm free enough to try to hear what is it that's also being revealed in that. And it, it always, it, you know, the, the, the heart is always both pain and joy. <clears throat> well, I don't want to be abrupt, but I feel like in terms of content, <laughs> we've covered quite a bit of ground. It's an awful lot. And I really, if there's, if you all are listening and if you can feel something happening, uh, maybe listen a couple of times and just feel it. Trying to feel what, what's 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 happening. Well, maybe one one of the, about this because it, it's about everything is still in the process of undergoing creation rather than already being here. Mm -hmm. But that's that's. But there's a second part to it that's even more important. Everything is in the process of being created coming into creation it's coming into form the coming into form that is never finished is called begetting 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 it's, it's in the very first image of Genesis I, all my life I've wondered you know when, in the first in the when God, God looks down and he sees the waters and he begins creation, he. <laughs> and so, so now we say also she, but the waters are already there. Mm -hmm. what come, what, the waters are necessary for, for the begetting of form, for the borning of everything into form. Those, the creating and begetting are the, are the pair, are the pair that is everything coming into being. That's, that, that, that's what it's in, yeah. Mm. Really, really, uh, this word begetting is just, It's the, it's the unknown aspect of the creating that is happening. We just. Right. So I'm not creating anything. I'm not creating, I haven't created anything. I'm not cre created this psychology at all. Yeah, I hope that I'm, I hope it's possible to, you know, feel like it's a, allowing something to come into form that is already present. So at least, I mean, that's kind of a, boy, that's a quick way to go through a lot of background. I think it sets us up though. So we will be doing this on a semi-regular basis. Um, and once again, we will be covering a lot of the material by no means exhaustively or chronologically from the notebooks, the collected works of integral spiritual psychology. Yeah. 
probably next time we'll work more work. That's the other word that's got to go away. <laughs> we'll try to allow uh, our attention to receive exactly what is happening within the heart and to uh, allow that to become conscious. But we'll see what happens, whatever happens. <laughs> well, very good. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. No, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm sure it sounded like babble, but you really helped it not be just babble. <laughs> well, it was something. I've been looking forward to it. So until next time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Piers, very much.